anoint. Come in the name of Jesus. Lord, everybody, praise the Lord, amen, we do honor the Lord, amen, for our being here on today, we praise God for his love, his kindness, and for all of his tender mercy, we thank him for every answered prayer, for making a way out of no way, <coughs> for opening doors that no man could shut, we just praise God for Jesus, we thank him, amen, for allowing us one more time <coughs> to come together to study his word on today. We praise God. We bring you greetings from Freedom Temple, Church of God in Christ, where the elder Billy Jamel Evans is our pastor. We praise God for his lovely wife, Sabrina. <clears throat> we thank God for all our elders, deacon, brethren, and we just bless God for the saints of the Most High God. Amen. We praise him, amen, for the opportunity Amen. To come before the people of God to say what thus said the Lord. We praise him. We're going to sing a little hymn. <clears throat> praise God. And then we're going to get into our lesson. I don't know what you come to do. 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 I come to clap my hand. 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 I come to stomp my feet. 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 I don't know what you come to do. 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 I didn't come to look at you. 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 But I come to pray his name. Oh, yes. I come to pray his name. Hallelujah. 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 Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for your loving kindness. Thanking you for all of your tender mercies. Thank you for your outstretched hand. We thank you for every way you made the doors that you've opened. Thank you for being merciful, oh God. Thank you for being so kind. Blessing our going out and coming in. Keeping us covered with your blood. Thank you for blessing the people of God everywhere. In their homes, on the jobs. Moving through the stores, oh God in the streets, Lord. We praise you for knowing, O oh God, that the angel of the Lord is encamped about us. We ask you to look on us and bless us on tonight. Give us an understanding mind and heart. Bless those that are listening in, those that need a word of encouragement. Bless our mouth, God. Anoint us for your services. Give us an understanding mind and heart. Break every yoke. Loose the bands of wickedness. Let the sick say I'm well. Send for healing, O oh God. Send for healing, Lord. Saints need a healing, Lord. Families need a healing. They need an encouragement, O oh God. Lift up, bow down heads. Bless and strengthen as never before. Look on our pastor, O oh God. Anoint him for your services. Sanctify his mind and heart. Keep him encouraged as never before. Keep him looking up to the hills. Oh, God, if you keep him up, God, he'll bless your people as never before. Oh, God, have your way in our lives. Take control of our mind and our hearts. Give us a yes as never before. Save us, oh, God. Fill us, Lord. Deliver us, Lord. Set free, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Amen. 
We just bless God, amen, once again for being out and being in the midst of the people of God. Amen. It is our pleasure, amen, every time the Lord allows us to come through the door, amen. And every time I come through the door, I don't feel like coming through the door, amen. But I bless God for being here on today, amen. I thank God for being a servant of the Lord, amen. That's all I am. I'm just a servant, and I'm here to provide a service if the Lord see, as the Lord sees fit. We thank God we are back in our missions lesson, <clears throat> and we are on lesson 11. And the subject of our lesson is situational ethics. I know this is going to be uh, somewhat confusing to a lot of people because I know you cannot just go in the book and just pull out what you think is situational. But we have a lot of situations in the scripture, and the ethics is of a very grave importance. Because our ethics deals with evaluation and, and not judging the situation. Our lesson is found in 1 Samuel, the 22nd, 7th chapter, 1 through 12. And as you can see, we have been dealing with David throughout missions session. We have been dealing with the various acts from the time David was called until God put him on the throne. And at this point in his life, he's yet not on the throne. But David has encountered some situations. And what is so significant about the situations that David encountered was the fact that it brought about a change in him. The things he found himself doing, that was not the David that we knew or the David we had been reading about up to this point. Our memory verse is found, Proverbs, the 16th chapter, and the second verse. And it reads as follows. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. That's the most dangerous point you can be in. In his own eyes. Read the scripture. Proverbs 16 and two. And I'm telling you here tonight, saints, this Proverbs, the 16th chapter, it's a lesson of his own. And it reads as follows. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. If every time you see yourself and you don't see no flaws, you're in trouble. Because you only clean in your own eyes. My mom used to tell us, say, you only that important to you. You ain't that important to everybody. So don't think everybody's looking at you or everybody's talking about you or everybody's whispering about you. It ain't like that. Because you're not that important. You're important to your mother, your father, and your sibling. And if you got a husband or you have a wife or you're engaged, something like that, you might be important to them. But you mess up, they'll show you how important that you're not. But God is forewarning us. Don't be like that. It says situational ethics. Don't be like that. The saints are to remain constant. We should remain the same 24-7, 365 days. If, you six, if you're sanctified on January the 1st, you should be fulfilling that. Only thing you ought to be doing is getting better by December the 31st. And when January the 1st come around again, you shouldn't be in those negative places, doing those negative things, 
thinking those negative thoughts. No, we should be done clean. We should be done grown up. I know every year you don't grow out a lot of stuff. I know that. Been there, done that. But I'm here to let you know, you keep on working at it. Don't give up. Don't throw up your hand every time I try. This happened, that happened. That ought to give, give you a greater endeavor to do better. It ought to give you a greater challenge to do better. You know why? Because the enemy is trying to prove that you won't do better. And now here it comes with this situational stuff. I used to say it myself. Circumstance alter the cases, but it ain't true. Because God's word don't change. The law itself was based on the Ten Commandments. The laws of the land, I told you that last week, how that some of the laws of the land are generated from the Ten Commandments. What a lot of people don't know, as an example for the subject of our lesson, situational, which is talking about specific, a certain circumstance, or either a certain condition. And what this situational ethics is saying is that because of the situation that you find yourself in, it ought to be able to change the ethic, the standard, the moral concept of a thing. Like, it's all right to do it. Example, in the Ten Commandments, God point blankly said, thou shall not kill. Now here, the world that we live in, it is not just indoctrinating our boys, but our young women as well, as to join the Army, or the Navy, or the Air Force, or the Marines. And what do they do? They teach them how to kill. That's a situation. That is a circumstance. We raise them up not to kill, but the United States, the military raises them to kill, or how to kill. And if you don't kill, they got a right to kill you in certain circumstances. But God told us what? Thou shall not kill. I do understand and I pray to you too that the laws of God are to who? The people of God. He told us to pray for them that are in authority. We got to pray for the president, for the mayor, for the governor, for the police. We got to pray for these people that we what? That we might live a peaceable life. Where? Down here on this earth. He told us who to pray for? Magistrates. Those that are in charge. And then he told us why. So that we can live peaceably. Because the saints are not into walking the street with oozies. We're not into that. We're not carrying a gun everywhere we go. You in the grocery store and got a gun in your pocket because you have legal license to carry it. That's not so with the people of God. We trust God for our going out and coming in. And I know everybody don't agree with that. I'm not asking you to agree with me. I just want you to agree with the word because the word is teaching us how we ought to live. There's a scripture In the book of Proverbs, it's related to the memory verse. It says, if you say, behold, we knew it. Do it not he that pondereth the heart consider it. It's talking about it, your situation. <laughs> you got to ponder this thing. And he that keepeth thy soul, do it not he know it. That's talking about God. That ain't talking about you. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eye because he's seeing it. He's judging it. You judging what's right and wrong according to your understanding. Right and wrong is based on God. You don't sin because you step on my foot. 
You sin when you transgress God's law. All you have to say to me is excuse me. Some people step on your foot and they don't say nothing. Put your foot in your pocket, all this old kind of stuff. We are not about that kind of situation. And now we're going to go into our lesson, which is in the book of Samuel. As I first stated, we're still dealing with David. David has been a mess since he came into the situation. He's been in a mess. He's been running from the king, his father-in-law, almost since he got to the palace. He became so angry that he didn't even want him to play no more, that the evil spirit leave him alone. You didn't see that he called for him no more. And the day that he missed coming to the table, because he normally eats with Saul, Saul was so angry that he threw a javelin and threw it at his son, Jonathan, because he said that Jonathan was conspiring with David against him. He began to accuse him. Jonathan was trying to make peace between David and his father because he knew that David had not did anything. In the 27th chapter, David did something that was almost unheard of. No one would have thought. It wouldn't have never crossed their mind that David would have did and took the route that he took. Because of after he slew Goliath, you know David didn't have no love for the Philistines. He wasn't about them Philistines, not at all. And if you read your lesson from the time David killed Goliath, he killed Philistines all the way up to the 26th chapter of the book. When they was down there destroying Cahelia, that town, David went down there. But he didn't go before he asked God. David knew that they needed to be delivered in that 26th chapter. He knew that. He knew that they were not fighters. Everybody is not a, a humbugger, as we call them. Everybody don't know how when somebody come up on them. They don't know how. Some people so tough with their mouth, they don't never even throw a lick. That's how rough you can be because you can use situational situations on your job that you could come off and forget about your ethics. You and another co-worker, you all are in competition for the same job. You know she got a bad rep. You know he got a bad rep. So what do you do? You start spreading their rep. <clears throat> How come they had to come to your department? That ain't nobody's business. That's not for you to do. You're not supposed to be a busybody in other men's matters. Other men's matters is not your business. If God wants their rep to be known, he'll make it known. Don't take it upon yourself to be the judge and the jury. That's what the ethics concern is about, that you want to be the judge and the jury. And what you do, you want to judge or evaluate the person's actions, that ain't your job. If people want to put the bad rep out on themselves, you leave them alone. <clears throat> leave them alone. That's the best thing you could do. That way you don't carry the negative weight of another person. Did you read, did we read the whole part of that memory verse? It said, clean in his own eyes, but the Lord, Weigheth the spirits. You know what that means? God judges and evaluates the action and the spirit behind what you did and why you did it. Why did you do that? You, you need to ask that of yourself. Ethics is very important because we need ethics to evaluate our own selves. Evaluate your own life criticism. Don't nobody know you like you but God. But you know you. You know if you're a liar. 
Don't talk about no spread, no truth. I'm just, I'm just spreading the truth. No, you know when you're a liar. You know when you're being manip manipulative. You know when you're being manipulative. Saints are not manipulators. They don't bribe. Now, if you do, that's a show. I'll do. But you got to do it first. I got to see that you're on my side. In the book, in our lesson, it says, if you do, quid pro quos. I'm going to spell it for you. It said, if you do Q-U-I-D, P-R-O, Q-U-O-S, if you do quid pro quo, all that means is one hand washes the other. You do me a favor, I'll do you one back. Don't worry, I got your back. When they come at you, I got you covered. When such and such happens, I got you. That's a manipulative behavior. Saints don't operate like that. You do by them the way you want people to do what? By you. That's what it means, treat them. This is how we treat. Sometimes it's not the easiest job in the world. Sometimes you have to do it with tears in your eyes, but you don't let them see you cry. You excuse yourself. You go to the bathroom. You be saying, help me, Lord, the whole time you're talking. Strengthen me, God, in your mind. Watch the thing when it gets to your heart. That's the first verse of the lesson. Watch it when that thing starts working in your heart. 27th chapter of Samuel and the first verse. It says, and David said, where? In his heart. Now, what did Jeremiah tell you about that heart? He said, the heart is desperately wicked and full of deceit. That's right. Your own heart can deceive you. It can deceive you. When I was a young woman growing up in the church, and I don't believe that spirit is dead and gone, I heard and I saw young women who declared that a man was their husband and he had a living wife. I don't care if she was sick, she was alive. And he was at home taking care of her. And they were telling different people in the church that's going to be my husband. Watch what's going on in your heart. That's why we pray daily. Lord, cleanse our mind. Cleanse our heart. Take everything away that's not like you. Clean us up, God. Clean us up. We have to get rid of stuff on a daily basis. Because guess what? You don't know what's in your heart. Because the Bible teaches what's in a man's heart, so is he. If there's a spirit working contrary in your heart that's not of God, that God is not pleased with, if you read his word, you'll see the things that God loves. God loves a cheerful heart. He wants the saints of God to be cheerful, be happy, and even in coming to church in this COVID. Every opportunity that the Lord provides for you to come to the house of God, get up and go. Put your mask on. Goggle in the morning. Wash your hands. Carry your stuff with you. Put it on. Get yourself ready. Make it to the house of God. If you feel all right being in the house of God like that, then go for it. But get up and do it. Stop making excuses. Stop talking about the COVID is everywhere. Well, if it's everywhere, it may be in your house already and you don't even know it. Don't do that to yourself. Don't let a lot of stuff that go on in your heart dictate how you ought to be by God. In everything David sought the Lord, he sought God, but he didn't seek God for this 27th chapter. 
He said, and David said in his heart, he was being motivated, I shall not perish one day by the hand of Saul. He done made up his mind that Saul was going to kill him. He done made up his mind. He got it all set that Saul was going to kill him. Now, why did he set it in his mind how that the Lord is going to provide a way of escape? That's what the Bible taught, that the Lord provided. That was nothing that David had gotten himself into, walked into knowingly or did it knowingly, that God didn't deliver him. He delivered him last week's lesson. He delivered him through Abigail. Abigail was able to speak to him. Yes, she was. She was able to appeal to what I said last week, his integrity. He want, she wanted him to know that because of his integrity, he didn't want to go into the kingship with her husband's blood on his sword. She wanted him to go in clean, with a clean slate. That's how we had President Obama. He went in with a clean slate, stayed there for eight years, come out with a clean slate. Yes, he did. They had nothing to say negative about him and Michelle. There's not but a few presidents that's been in office that haven't got caught up in something. But the young man had some integrity about himself. He had some integrity. And he knew how to hold himself. But here, I guess David had got, in our lesson it teaches us that, he had become weary because of the nature that of Saul that he was dealing with. And he knew that it was a dishonor for him to do anything against Saul. He felt so bad in the 26th chapter about taking Saul's spear and his water. He felt so bad. But his soldier that was with him, huh, he called it a blessing. <laughs> Abishai. Abishai said, the Lord have delivered Saul into thy hand. David had made it to his camp. And all Saul's bodyguards was around him, true enough, but they were asleep. They were sleeping so tough that David was able to go in, get Saul's spear and flag it of water. And they didn't wake up. Nobody should be that sound and you on God. And David called them in question. He called them in question. That was a situation. And if David had killed Saul, that would have went against his teaching, his training, his ethics. The greatest ethics that we have is in the word of God. It's in God's word. Don't take no position in the church and you're not going to be faithful to that position. Leave it alone. Let somebody take it that want it, that love it, that can do it. There's somebody that loves keeping the church clean. You better know it. Everybody don't love. That's the reason why some are cleaning, they debating, they questioning, they arguing. They all not let them in. They shouldn't be eating. They shouldn't be drinking. All those kinds of things go on in the process of cleaning. How you know, Catherine House, I used to clean the church. For 10 years, I cleaned the church. And used to get up and make an announcement. Will you people please take your kids' clothes home? Will you please put the baby diapers in the garbage? Will you don't leave this in the sanctuary? Will you don't leave your kids' food? Will you clean off the bench where they were sitting? I used to make those kinds of announcements. Until one lady said, it calls an offense. She had 11 kids. So that means I need to shut my mouth and clean up and leave it alone or leave it alone. Because if you're going to gripe and debate about it, don't do it. You should be responsible. 
You should be there when nobody else is there. If this is your job. If this is your job. I took the minutes on Tuesday nights. And I was there before everybody, including pastor. I set up, I put the books up and whatever and whatever. And I was a very timely, orderly person. I went to the parties on time. Yes, I do. I want to be the first one there because I'm going to be the loudest. I'm going to separate the records that I want to hear. Then everybody hear what they want to hear after me because I was there first. So whoever party I was at, they let me go for broke. You got to learn and you got to be obedient. Oh, yes, you do. This is part of ethics. You got to be dependable. Your pastor, your sister pastor, the president of whatever program that you're working in, you got to be dependable because circumstances alter cases. Yes, it does. The car can break down. Somebody can become very ill. Somebody needs to be able to step up and be ready to step up. If you are that chosen person to step up when your pastor's not there, be ready. At all times, be ready. I told Bishop Marshall one Wednesday night, I said, Bishop, if you see something that's going on and you need to stop talking, I said, throw me the mic. I said, I ain't scared. Throw it to me. God knows we need people that are dependable. In the day and time that we're living in, we need somebody to see after the elderly, to see after the sick. You may not can go to everybody's house, call, see what they want. They might need some simple stuff, milk, meat, and bread. Some simple stuff. But you'll never know if you don't call them. Some of them don't want to bother nobody. We're talking about situational ethics. We're talking about things that should be in us. These things should be a part of the characteristics of ethics. Because you have to use ethics to look at you. Huh. And be honest about you. Are you kindly affectionate? Are you loving one another? Are we patient with one another? Are we forbearing with one another? Come on now. Galatians 5, the fruit of the spirit. Guess what? The works of the flesh are in there too. So you can compare what spirit are you working in? That's what he was talking about. But the Lord weighed the spirits. He evaluated the spirits. There is a reason why we do everything we do. You get a watch when you're being motivated by the things in your heart. Ask God about it. David did not ask the Lord at this given time, but he made up in his mind. He said, there's nothing better for me than I should speedily escape. Get away right now. He said, into the land of the Philistine, into the land of the church's enemy. This is who they fought for years, were the Philistine. They fighting the Philistines over in Saudi Arabia right now. They still fighting with the Philistines. And Saul shall despair of me. You know why he knew that Saul wasn't going to come? Because Saul didn't have enough men. He didn't have fighting men like David had. David had 600 warriors, men that knew how to fight. They were what you call rebels. They weren't scared. They weren't scared. They would give their life for David. David wanted a drink of water out of Jerusalem. And some of his men crossed the enemy's line and went over there and got David some water. David wouldn't even drink it. He poured it out as a sacrifice because those young men risked their lives to fulfill a desire that he had. And David did not ask them to. He said, I should speedily hurry up and get into the lands of the Philistines. Go where my enemy live. Who in the world wants to go and abide with their enemy? My God. And Saul shall despair of me. Saul don't give up on me. To seek me anymore in any coast of Israel, so shall I escape out of his hand. He saw this as a way of escape. 
but he had a plan. And David arose and he passed over with the 600 men that were with him unto Achish. Now Achish was the king of Gath. Gath is the town where Goliath come from. And Goliath had, I, the scriptures say he had, I think it said he had six brothers. He had so many brothers that was just like him. Tall, warriors, and heavyweights in Gath. But that's where David went to live. Because he knew that the king wasn't going to look for him. That he wasn't coming there. And David dwelt with Achish at Gath. He and his men. Every man with his household. Even David with his two wives. Honiam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the Carmelitess, Nabal's wife. And it was told Saul that David was fled to Gath. And he saw him no more again. He didn't come after him. Not then, anyway. He didn't come after him. As long as he was down in Gath, he wasn't coming after him. Because if you remember, when Goliath was there in the valley, Saul wasn't down there. And as soon as David told him that he would go, Saul hurriedly gave him his armor. And David told him he couldn't use it because he never tried it. He would support somebody that was going down there, but he didn't go down there. He was the king. He didn't have to go fight. They told him, they told the people when they made him king that he was going to take his son, take your sons and put them in his army. They was going to run before him and after him. They took the folks' children and put them in his army to fight. If they lost their life, they just lost their life. But, but Saul didn't, he didn't saw, he seek after David anymore because he was scared of them Philistines. And David said unto Achish, if I have found grace in thine eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country <clears throat> that I may dwell there. For why should thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? Remember when I was talking about being manipulative? That's all David was doing, was being manipulative. That wasn't nothing but a setup. Watch folks that always want to do something, something with you or for you. Watch them when they always. A real friend don't always want to go and do. Some folks don't believe that. A real friend don't have to live in your house or in your town. Not a real friend. A real friend lives somewhere else most of the time. You can't run to them when you feel like it. I'm talking about a real friend. What makes them a real friend? Because when they speak, when they judge, when they deal, when they make decisions, they make it according to how you guys interact. A real friend can say, uh-uh, that ain't right. You ain't got no business doing that. What you say that for? We had a church mother in my old church, and she rebuked the saints sharply for wearing apples. Now, I love the Afro. I wore Afro before Afros came out. When she said that one Sunday, when I came back to church the next Sunday, my hair was pressed and curled. And it was so many of them that had an Afro that didn't even wear Afro. They washed their hair and rolled them with rollers and picked it out, and they did it deliberately. They did it deliberately. And the church mother just looked at them. She said, uh-huh. And she did one of her numbers. She said, I know who's saved up in here. She challenged their salvation by their disobedience. She said, you wear your hair, your clothes. You wear what you want when you're around your friends and your family and in your house. 
But she always dealt with how you should look in the house of God. We are ambassadors. We are presenters. We should look the part that where we can send somebody out at any time. We have a young lady in our church. Her name is Alicia. And I read a writing that she had wrote concerning Bishop Marshall's messages and how she had written them down and what she got up. I was so impressed with her, I didn't know what to do. I was very impressed. Very impressed. I even told my children about her. I said, and she's a young lady. She wasn't even in high school when she wrote that. And I bless God. I bless God for it. And I told the kids. I say it's something to learn from everybody. It's something to learn. And I had her little writing in my hand while I was, so I didn't make a mistake. I didn't add to it, and I didn't take away from it. It's something about us, saints. We are a peculiar people. Not crazy. We are peculiar. Because they flying off at the handle. We should not take that as a situation to lay our ethics, our biblical training down. It's not for us to do. Just because they're talking loud and cursing you on the job, that don't mean you revert back to Catherine. You have to maintain Sister House's position. Because why? You represent God. You represent the church. You, are a, you call yourself a child of the king. That's why I know you got to act like it. You got to walk like it. You got to talk like it. You don't allow no situation. Your sons, your daughters, your husband, your wife. You don't let nothing, your mother, your father, come in and change your attributes. You got to maintain who you are in God at all times. Some of these things hurt. Some of them are disappointing. But you want your life to be pleasing unto him. David wasn't thinking about it at that given time. He was looking for a place to be safe, to dwell safely. He had 600 men that he had to protect, get them houses, get them land. And Achish thought that David was on his side. So he gave him Ziglag. And in our lesson, it said that Ziglag, up until now, belongs to Judah. Achish gave it to him. David didn't automatically live there, but Achish gave it. He said that day he gave, the day David asked him for it, because he wanted him. You know why? Because he was going to need a favor from him. Wherefore Ziglash pertained unto the kings of Judah until this day. And the time that David dwelled in the country of the Philistine was he lived there one year and four months. And David and his men went up. They went out. They went to go and invade the land. Now, you are not going to read what God told him to do it. You're not going to read what you found that David asked God, should he go? You're not going to see what God, David asked God anything. Shall I defeat him? Shall I take it? Is it going to come to me? And if you read it, he had one, two, Three, four. This was four different nations of people before you get to Egypt, before you got there. David and 600 men went in and killed everybody. David didn't ask God. I'm not saying that you'll go in and kill anybody. But the worst thing you can see acting out of order is a believer that's operating in the flesh. Right now, David is in his flesh. 
And that lets you know what? You can get in yours. You can actually, as the old folks say, get beside yourself. I said it earlier. You think you all that, but you're not. You can actually get beside yourself because of who you are or who you think you are or whose friend you are. I'm the close friend of the bishop. So what? What does that mean? The pastor is my uncle. And what does that mean? You got to line up like everybody else. When the pastor says sit down, you're supposed to sit down. When he said don't walk, you don't walk either. That does not give his children privilege to do anything. If anybody ought to be an example of the good works and obedience to their father, it's the children who are the children of the leader. Because folks are piggyback over there. They will piggyback. If the pastor's kids don't have to do it, my kids ain't got to do it either. If their kids don't have to sit in the service, why should mine sit in the service? If they could be in all-purpose room, if they could be in this room, if they, why can't mine be in there? There's always a situation. But situations, those are not, those are not for the people of God. <laughs> oh, no, they're not. <laughs> it is never recommended evil for evil. And this act that David did, Achish thought, when David told him that he killed men and women, Achish thought that he had killed the children of Israel, but David didn't. He stooped to a low that he never had been. He has been able to go through the towns, go past the people, and not do them any harm. But David went into these towns. And he killed all the people. Lord, have mercy. He killed all the men. And he killed all the women. Because David didn't want anybody to be able to say anything against him. But Achish knew he had been somewhere. Because David came and told him. <laughs> He told him in the eighth verse where he'd been, and in the ninth verse, he told him what he did. And David smote the land and left neither man nor woman alive. He killed them. He took their life and took away the sheep and the oxen and the asses and the camels and the apparel. He took their clothing and returned and came to Achish. He brought it to Achish. So Achish thought he had him. And Achish said, whether have ye made a road today? Where you been? Where you been? Because he brought the goods back with him. He wanted to know what town. And David said, against the south of Judah. <laughs> and against the south of the Judah Melites. The Judah Melites. And against the south of the Kenites, all of those to the south of those three towns were not, they were not Israelite people. They were in their town, but they were not Israelites. Those were some of the inhabitants of the land of Canaan that Joshua was supposed to get rid of. They were supposed to get rid of all of them, but as you see, they didn't. And David saved neither man nor woman alive. And then he tell him why. To bring tidings to Gath. They couldn't come to Gath and say nothing, so he killed. He destroyed everybody that saw and heard everything that he did. Who did this? David. It was nobody to call his name. So he took it upon himself to let Achish know exactly what he had done. He said, least they should tell on us. That was it. Saying, so did David. David did this, and so will be his manner all the while he dwelleth in the country of the Philistine. This is all he did. And he made Achish feel good. 
Because Achish had this, was a hole he thought against David. When you start doing things for people, for favors, you better watch yourself. Don't allow yourself to get caught up. Don't allow yourself to get caught up. Because you can get yourself in a mess doing favors that's not according to the will of God. It is never God's will that we come against one another. He told us in his word, he said, if you fight and devour one another, we're going to be consumed one of another. You can't fight me and think you're going to make it. You may destroy my influence. You may take some things away from me. You can never take my salvation. I got to give it up. I got to walk away. I got to throw up my hands and say it ain't nothing to it. Because you can't take it. Long as I want it, I can have it. Some folks teach one sin, Christ never out. You can walk away from God anytime you feel like it. When you feel like it, you can say it ain't nothing to him. God ain't got no noose around our head. He ain't holding no gun on us. He's not. He's allowing us. This is a whosoever will walk. That's why you can't take advantage of no situation in no ethics. It will not work. I read one of the philosopher's writings concerning ethics and situation, and I wrote it down of my, in my book. It said this, the philosopher. He said, it is a contradiction, absolute moral codes according to the Bible. The Bible itself is against situational ethics because there is no such thing. We operate, we live, we move, we have our beings. All of that is what? According to the word of God. You're not supposed to be operating according to your will or how you see it. Definitely not how you feel. God ain't told you to love your brethren because you feel it. No, he didn't. He said, do it because it is a commandment. He said, a new commandment I give unto thee is that ye love one another. Then he told us, he said, Pray ye one for another. We got to keep each other up in prayer. Keep each other lifted. We got to keep each other encouraged when we can, where we can, however we can. There is a law for us. The ethics of God is his word. You want to know how to be bad people? Look into the word of God. God got an answer for every problem. God got an answer for every situation. Never is it to hurt. Never is it to turn your back. I declare if you can help, help. Do whatever you can do. You ain't doing it for your name to be called. Your name is not important. I told you last week, ain't no power in your name. There is no power. There is no power in your name. You make it go by a car. You make it go this, that, and the other. You make it do all of that. I got a $30,000 credit card in my husband's name the other day, Friday or Saturday. I tore it up. One year, I got one for $50,000. My daughter said, we go on shopping. I burned it up. I set it on fire. That ain't nothing but a trick to put me in another noose. And I bless God for being out of the noose. Ain't got no noose on my neck. Praise God. We ought to be like that about each other. This pandemic has blocked so many of the people of God. But it's enough of us to go after them. There is enough of us. We can't be afraid to do God's will versus what man is saying. I'm not telling anybody to go against the laws or the land or the rules or the shutdown or the backup. I'm not saying any of that. 
Because if the virus can go through a phone, we in trouble. If it can go through the computer, we are in dire trouble. But we can pick up the phone and say, greetings, sister, my brother. The Lord laid you on my heart. I was thinking about you. Yes, it did. You could do it. And then you could talk, and the conversation could lead from there. And then they could begin to share, and you could give some feedback if you can. Don't try to be all that. You don't know everything. I don't know everything. I don't want to act like I know everything. If I don't read, if I don't study, I don't know nothing. And I listen to preachers all day, every day. I find me somebody preaching on the virtual. And I listen to them. And things that strike my attention, I write them down. Yes, I do. See, David was a moderate man. Even though he was a warrior, he was moderate in the things that he did. He was not wild. This was a wild thing he did right here. David had never, you wouldn't have thought of him being a patriot of Israel, you wouldn't have never thought of him of going to live with the enemy. He was living with the Philistine. He was living with the enemy. You don't sleep with the enemy knowingly. You don't be hanging out at the enemy's house knowingly. Not knowingly. We don't do that as the people of God. We try to avoid. The scripture tells us to shun the very, shun it, the very presence of evil. When you know evil is there, evil is lurking, evil is working. They set up to do evil. You know what they're about. You know what, you know what family and friends, yes you do. You know what page they're on. You know what they are about. Shun them. God will send you somebody else. He'll send you a friend. He'll send you somebody that will work with you, that will walk with you, that will talk with you, that will be there for you. Somebody that will tell you, sister, you're wrong. Brother, you're wrong. That's what we need in this day and time because ain't too many people, got too many people coming around them to share anything with them. We got to go. We got to be able to talk to them. We got to be able to encourage them. Tell them to use those same attributes that they was using while they was walking to and from in the church. Use them on the phone and talk to the people of God. You can minister. You can be that evangelist. You can be that teacher. You, the deacon is after teach. You can be a teacher deacon. That's what happened to Philip, and he became an evangelist. Don't be scared to open your mouth and say what thus said the Lord. He put a word in your mouth. He put a word in the layman's mouth. You got folks that sitting back that don't say nothing. But if you give them the opportunity, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be scattered and don't be scared. Step out on God and be what the Lord will have you to be. Use those ethics that God has given you. We call them characteristics. You ain't got to work in the flesh. You overcome fear by faith. You overcome fear with faith. You overcome hatred with love. Can't nothing else destroy and bring hatred down but love. You can love them enough that they won't bother you. When you love somebody enough and they tell you to your face, you ain't good for an argument, you're doing all right. And that's going to stay with me until the Lord takes me somewhere. That's how God wanted it to be. He wants you to be able to work teamwork. Do it as a team. That's one thing that I love about our missionary board. They're not scared to put forth a team effort. Everybody just about have a point of view. And we have to do it in unison. We cannot be an active program in the church 
functioning against one another, being full of hatred or bitterness or jealousy. When we were down and out and poor, yes, we were, and I had cardboard glue in the bottom of my shoe, my mother told us this. She said, you ain't got to be jealous of nothing nobody have. She said, because one day, one day, you're not going to have no holes in your shoe. She told me that. She told me I wasn't going to have no holes in my shoes, and I'm going to have everything I need. She said, and some of what I want. She wasn't in church, but she told me that because we were going through. We were going through, but she taught us something called ethics. Yes, she did. She taught us how to have some integrity about ourselves. My mom said, when you're cocky, people don't like you. I found that out when I used to answer every question in church. I tried. And I got more bitterness than the law allows. You think you're smarter than everybody else. No, I wasn't. I read, like I said. I studied. I tried to know. I had some integrity about myself. I was reliable. I was dependable. And there were things that I wanted to do. I wanted to be what the Lord would have me to be. And I thought if I studied and I read and I read and I read, I thought I would be respected. I thought people would like me. I thought they would care about me. But I thought wrong. I found out that I made more enemies than I've ever made in my entire life. Because everybody is not the same. I try to discipline myself. They wanted to know, was I scared? I tried to discipline. No, I wasn't scared. I was trying to discipline. Because if I didn't discipline myself, that means that I was going to act out of order. Do you hear me, saints? If you don't discipline yourself, you will act out of order. You got to discipline your mouth to not to talk so much, your eyes, so you ain't always looking at the wrong thing, your ears, that you don't have those itching ears ready to hear something negative about somebody. Feet, you ran to go so you can see what somebody else is talking about. Not your hands. You want to touch stuff that you ain't got no business touching. Do you hear me? Discipline. We must maintain discipline over ourselves. You got to be determined. And you got to maintain your professionalism. You say you're a saint. I declare that's the life you live. That is a profession that you show for. If you're a saint, act like it. When your lips ain't moving, act like it. When people calling your name, still act like it. If you haven't been referred to as a dog or treated as a dog, tell God thank you, but have a mind to act like it. It's more to it than what we think it is. The Lord is soon to come. He's coming back one day. And he wants us to line up with his word. He wants us to be found in order doing whatever he gave us to do. If I said earlier, if you're a keeper of the church, if you keep it clean, be responsible. If you open the door, be on time. If you collect the offering, do it with simplicity. Help us to believe and receive your promises of God because that's what he is requiring. We thank God for all those that listen in for us with us on tonight. We pray that God will bless us, that he will keep us in the hour of temptation, that the Lord will bless us to maintain his word, that our ethics will be generated according to the word of God, that we walk, that we talk according to to his word. Let our steps be altered. That's what the scripture said. 
It said, a good man's step, let it be altered by the Lord. Don't let us take it upon ourselves to do anything. Ask God, when you go to console, ask God to give you words to say. Ask the Lord in Jesus' name. Now we're going to have our closing prayer in Jesus' name. Gracious Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for your loving kindness and all of your tender mercies. We thank you for how we hear, how you hear and answer prayer. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for how that your ears is open to the prayers of the righteous. Oh, God, cleanse the minds and hearts of your people. Make of us what you'd have us to be. Don't let us find an occasion to do wrong, God. Keep us with our mind and heart stayed on thee. Keep us with a yes on the inside. Help us to be determined to do thy will, O oh God. Sanctify us as never before. Let your will be done in our life. Cover us with your blood. Keep us in your prayer. Continue to bless the people, O oh God, everywhere. Bless the sick and afflicted, O oh God. Bless my Freedom Temple family. Have your way in their lives. Bless the saints on the four corners of the earth, God. Keep them in your care. Help us to be mindful of your goodness. Help us to say yes as never before. These blessings we ask in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Look on our page and you will see the ways in which you can give to our Freedom Temple Church. We praise God for your giving for what you've done, for what you're doing, and for what you're going to do. Please pray our strength in the Lord. Amen. Much for we are able to be sustained because of your generosity, your compassion. Thank you so much for your love and support of our church. Thank you so much for sustaining us through this pandemic we haven't missed a beat it is because of the lord's mercies that we are not consumed the lord touching your hearts you my brother you my